Well, it's a lovely spring day and I'm out here on the north coast of Aberdeenshire near Troop Head and I want to talk about my uh, solar panel uh, performance for April. Now, if you haven't watched my previous videos, uh, I've got a uh, solar panel array which is nearly 9 kilowatts in size. Um, each solar panel has got a power optimizer and they are all connected to a solar edge inverter which also has a hot water controller for uh, taking excess solar power. So how have my solar panels done this month? So last month my predictions for April were that we we're going to generate one megawatt hour of electricity and the actual result was that we generated 1.04 megawatt hours. So that's an impressive result. So 83% of my electricity consumed came from my solar panels. That meant that only 17% was imported from the grid. And the other thing to note was that in terms of the comparison from between import and export, uh, we exported 700 kilowatt hours of electricity but we only imported 69 kilowatt hours. So this is a, a month where I'm starting to make money on my solar panels and that money made will help offset the money I've spent uh, in the winter time. So the best day for electricity generation was the 25th of April and we generated just under 52 kilowatt hours of electricity. And if you have a look at the profile on a graph, it's almost Christmas pudding shaped with a few spikes in the middle. And those spikes correspond to times when I switched on heavy consumers such as a washing machine or a dishwasher. And they exist, these spikes, these generation spikes, simply because we've got an export limit. So if we can generate more electricity, we can unlock more of that uh, solar power. Conversely, the worst day for electricity generation was the very next day on the 26th of April. Here we generated nine kilowatt hours of electricity. But the interesting thing to note about this day was that in spite of the heavy cloud and the, and the rain, we still generated more electricity than we consumed. And it demonstrates the value of having a large solar panel array. So if you compare this month to the previous months, the proportion of electricity that comes from solar, regardless of whether you're using hot water or not, is much, much higher. And it, it shows, amongst other things, the fact that you don't need batteries at this time of the year in order to get uh, a lot of value out of your solar panels. The other interesting thing to note is that the overall quantity of electricity consumption has gone up. Now in historical months consumption has gone down as we go from through spring into summertime and what this shows is that I'm taking advantage of the additional uh, solar power generated to do things such as uh, run underfloor heating and uh, do some cryptocurrency mining. Um, so it's about getting extra value out of the solar panels uh, where previously that opportunity didn't exist. So the next question to ask is um, what's the prediction uh, not just for next month but for the whole year? So in making a prediction for the whole year, we can use the site in Aberdeen to get some insights. I'm going to make an assumption that the profile uh, leading up to April is going to be symmetric on the other side of the uh, summer months. Um, but if we look at the months from April to August, every single one of them uh, was above one megawatt hour in terms of generation. So we can make the assumption that the statistics for April also apply uh, right through until August. So let's see what happens when we put that into a spreadsheet. So once I crunch these numbers, I end up with a total production estimate for the year of 7.9 megawatt hours almost. Now, bear in mind that the estimate in my quote was 7.1 megawatt hours. So now the question is, um, what happens when I plug these numbers in, along with other statistics, uh, into the calculator I used um, in order to make the investment decision? So this was the spreadsheet I used. I've made a few modifications for presentational purposes, 
But um, the old numbers I had uh, gave me a 14 year payback uh, based on 7.1 megawatt hours and 50% of my electrical consumption coming from my solar panels. And the overall payback amount over 25 years was reckoned to be 29,000 pounds almost. So let's see what happens when I put the new numbers in. So here's the results with the new figures. 11 years payback instead of 14 years. We've got higher electricity consumption and we're using a higher proportion of our electricity consumption from uh, solar panels. But there's one other thing and that's inflation. Previously I assumed a 6% rate of inflation for the price of electricity. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that last year the price of electricity was 15 pence per kilowatt hour and now it's 18 and a half pence per kilowatt hour as of the middle of May. So that's a 23% rate of inflation. And I'm pretty sure that won't be uh, sustained over the whole uh, payback period of the solar panels. But it does suggest that 6% is very conservative. So I increased the assumed rate of inflation up to 8%. And uh, the results are very interesting. Uh, but I've got more to say about inflation later on in this video. Now I've talked about batteries in the past, but that talk was all based on assumptions. And now I've got the data, I want to ask the question again, what value does a battery bring to my house? So I've taken my previous number crunching uh, spreadsheet and I've added some considerations for battery capacity uh, depth of discharge and efficiency for that battery. And what I'm looking at is the export that we've generated uh, for each day in this column. And I've started asking the question, how much uh, in imported electricity can we avoid for the whole year? If we go from January into summertime, you can see that um, the battery ends up as a flat battery at the end of each at the end of most days in January. As we go into February, uh, the battery is starting to charge up with more electricity being generated each day than consumed. And then uh, into March, you can see that the battery is fully charged and, and saturated. And this is the imported electricity that we have if we didn't have a battery. Uh, but if we do have a battery, this is the import from the grid that we do have. And if we plot this on a graph, this is what we get. Uh, on the X axis, we've got the battery size. And on the Y axis, we've got the amount of electricity that we import from the grid. And as you can see, uh, the bigger your battery, up to about five kilowatt hours, uh, we get large savings in terms of uh, avoided grid import. But once you increase your battery size beyond five kilowatt hours, the savings in terms of avoided imported energy uh, result in a much smaller re return on investment. And that's not so useful. So clearly with a fixed price for electricity, if we were to take electricity during the daytime, store it in a battery and export it in the evening time when demand is higher, we wouldn't get any value out of our battery for that. But what if there was a different price for a different time of the day and we got a higher price for high demand periods of that day? All of a sudden, things start getting a bit more interesting. So with Octopus Agile, you've got a unique price for each half hour period of the day for each day of the year. And rather than taking a guessing game at what those prices might be in the future, we can have a look at historical data and you can go to this website on Energy Stats UK and you can download CSV files. And we've got two spreadsheets. One is for the import tariff and the other one is for the outgoing tariff. So this is what the data looks like when I paste it into my spreadsheet. And we've got a half hour uh, price here. And what I'll do is I'll take that into my main spreadsheet. and we have the lowest import price for each day and we've got the highest export price for each day. And what we can do is look at uh, the amount of electricity that we are importing 
in order to charge up the battery sufficient to cover our electricity usage. And likewise, we can take a fully charged battery uh, due to sunshine and we can export any surplus. So in January, uh, there's a lot of import and into March, we've got a lot of uh, surplus power which is being uh, exported. And as we go through into April, you can see that pretty much the whole battery capacity is being uh, exported most days. Um, but there's more. That's just charging up the battery uh, needed to meet our own demand. We've got a difference in the price. Um, if you have a look at these three days in January, for example, you're getting paid over one pound per kilowatt hour to export that electricity. So it makes sense to import electricity at this cheap price and export it at this expensive price. And uh, it's essentially, um, uh, you, you can uh, get some money for that. So when we add all of that up, most of the value is in exporting surplus solar power uh, in the summertime at a more expensive time of the evening. Um, and then uh, have using the remaining capacity of the battery to get your, ma uh, your, your price difference there uh, results in £97. So you end up with £550 almost of uh, value from your battery in the case of a 16 kilowatt hour battery. And if we have a look at that on a chart for all battery sizes, you can see now that there is actually a reason why you might want to go for a battery that's bigger than five kilowatt hours, but you still get your best value per kilowatt hour for battery sizes, which are uh, less than five kilowatt hours. So clearly there's an awful lot more value to be had out of your battery when you use the full duty cycle in each day and you take advantage of those price differences in electricity. But even so, the value generated each year will result in a payback that is still longer than 10 years. And when you consider that the typical lifetime for a stationary battery is about 10 to 15 years anyway, you're not going to get your, uh, your money's worth out of the battery. That's going to change. There are much cheaper chemistries which are being developed. Um, nickel manganese cobalt is the dominant chemistry and it's used a lot in cars. It's very high energy density, but it has much shorter duty cycles. Lithium ion phosphate, on the other hand, can last far longer in terms of duty cycle length. It's somewhere around 10,000 duty cycles compared to about 3,000 duty cycles for nickel manganese cobalt. And it's cheaper. So things are looking promising for uh, batteries in the future but right now um, they're still not quite there yet in terms of value so I touched upon inflation previously and I left people with the impression that inflation was going to be uh, very high but the reality is that it's going to be much more complicated than that when it comes to flat rates of electricity I think inflation will indeed be very high and the reason for that is that demand for electricity is likely to go up in the future. So electrical supply is typically constrained around early evening time when demand is typically highest during the day. And when you add more electrical cars into the mix, um, that creates uh, additional uh, demand that you don't want to have at that time of the day. So. Whilst flat rates of electricity will go up, I think variable rates of electricity will be the place where cheaper opportunities exist. But in order to take advantage of those variable rates fully, you need solar panels and you need uh, batteries. So the answer in terms of inflation, which underpins a lot of my assumptions about uh, the economic return on my solar panels, is complicated. So I'd like to thank you for watching this video and I hope you've enjoyed the backdrop. This is uh, looking out from Troop Head uh, towards Pennon and uh, off to Rose Hearty. Um, it's a beautiful corner of my country and uh, hopefully I will see you in a month's time and if not in a month's time, hopefully I'll see you on some of my walks which I have in the meantime.